Hi friends, once again welcome to the Nurse Channel. So as you all aware that uh, we started uh, our new series known as the Ains Nosset series, and this is the second set of uh, questions what we are uploading now. And this is uh, just a 35 minute video that definitely will help you to prepare better for your upcoming Ains Nosset examinations as well as other competitive nursing officer examinations. So as I, as I told in the old videos, these 15 questions which are taken from different aspects of nursing subjects will definitely help you to prepare well. Why? Because means that each questions and its explanations and the, and the options and its explanations, the picture based questions, picture based images, all these things will definitely will help you to prepare much, much better for your examinations. So straight away without losing time, we will go to the videos. Before that, uh, uh, I request everyone who are watching this video uh, to watch the video till the end without skipping. Because as I told before, each and everything is very, very important. So and one more request, whoever not yet subscribe our channel, kindly subscribe this channel and kindly support us. So straight away, we will move on to the second series, second set of questions in this names nor set series. So the second Norset series starts here. So the first question in this series is in the screen right now. So the question is, which is the most common carcinoma associated with cryptorchidism? Which is the most common carcinoma associated with cryptorchidism? So first of all, you should understand what is cryptorchidism. So what is cryptorchidism? That is an undescended testis. So you know that the undescended cystis uh, can leads to chances for the malignancy okay so which malignancy which carcinoma is most common that is a question for you and the options are option number a known seminomas option number b seminomas option number c teratomas and option number d choriocarcinoma so among these which is the most common carcinoma associated with undescended testis that is a question for you so what is the answer so the answer for this question is option number B that is seminomas. Okay, seminoma. So we will have a small explanation regarding this question. So what is a seminoma? So a type of cancer that begins in germ cells in the main. Okay, so what is a germ cell? Germ cells are cells that form the sperm in males or eggs in the females. So seminomas occur most often in the testicle but they may also occur in other areas of the body such as the brain, chest, abdomen, uh, etc. Okay, and the characteristics is that the seminomas tend to grow and spread slowly. Okay, so these are the some key points that you should understand regarding the seminomas which is occurring in the germ cells in the male and it is most commonly happening uh, carcinoma related to the undescended testis or uh, which one? That cryptorchidism. So what is a choriocarcinoma? So as the name indicates, it's a highly malignant neoplasm that most commonly occurs in females and it is related to a gestational event. So in males, the choriocarcinomas are generally considered as a known seminomatous germ cell tumor which represents less than 1% of all the germ cell tumors. Okay, 5%, sorry. Less than 5% of all germ cell tumors in the male. Okay, so choriocarcinoma is always associated with the female carcinoma. Okay, then next option was the teratoma. So what is a teratoma? So these are the tumors which are benign but can become malignant and these are the most common type of germ cell tumors which can develop in extra gonadal area. Okay, so the germ cell tumor that is originating in the uh, gen, uh, gonadal area already we have explained that is a seminomas. So teratomas are these seminomas which are occurring outside extra gonadal that is not in the ovary or in the testis and uh, these are known as the teratomas. Okay, so we are getting some uh, information regarding the few carcinomas. Okay, so I think that is clear for you. Now, uh, a term that you have to remember related to this uh, or, uh, orchidoplex, sorry, uh, this cryptorchidism that is orchioplexy. So what is orchioplexy? That is the restoration of the undescended testis back into the scrotum and uh, keeping the testis in the scrotum, keeping and uh, fixing the uh, undescended testis from the abdominal cavity to the scrotum is known as the orchioplexy. Okay, so this is an additional information for you. So moving on to the next question in the series, that is the second question and the question is cholesterol is rich in which among the following? 
So the question is cholesterol is rich in which among the following? So options for you are option number A vitamin A, option number B vitamin B, option number C vitamin E and option number D vitamin B1. So among this which is most abundant, which is rich in cholesterol. So the answer for this question is option number A that is vitamin A, vitamin A. So we know that cholesterol it is a rich in developmental factors such as epidermal growth factors such as immunological components such as secretory IgA then lactoferrin, leukocytes etc. So in addition it contains high amounts of protein then vitamin A, vitamin B12 and vitamin K and lower levels of lactose. Okay. So these are the uh, components of the cholesterol. Okay. Mainly epidermal growth factors then immunological components. Epidermal growth factors and immunological components like IgA, lactoferrin, leukocytes and proteins, vitamins like vitamin B12, vitamin A and vitamin K and lower levels of lactose. Okay. So moving on to the third question in our series. The question is normal mid arm circumference is above dash. So the question is a normal value, normal mid upper arm circumference. Usually it is noted as MUAC that is mid arm, mid upper arm circumference is above dash. So what is the normal value? So the options for you are option number A 10.5 centimeters, option number B 12.5 centimeters, option number C 13.5 centimeters and option number D 14.5 centimeter. So which is considered to be as normal. The answer is option number C that is 13.5 centimeter and above. Okay. So and mid upper arm circumference less than 12.5 suggests malnutrition and a value greater than 13.5 centimeter is considered to be normal. Okay. Less than 12.5 malnutrition above 13.5 is considered to be as normal. Okay. So it's a, just a small important question. Now we will move on to the next question in our series that is a fourth question and the question is which among the following is mainly used to assess the pattern of fetal growth in small for gestational age infants. Okay, So the question is pattern of fetal growth in small for gestational age infants. So the options for you are option number A Ponteral index, option number B Corpulence index, option number C Rohrer's index and option number D all the above. So you have heard about the body mass index right. So same like that that is this is another index. So what is the answer? To assess the pattern of fetal growth in small for gestational age infants. And there are some other usages also that we will see in the explanation session. So the answer for this option is option number D that is all the above. This is uh, all related to the ponderal index or the corpulence index or the Rohrer's index. So it is also known as ponderal index is also known as the corpulence index or the Rohrer's index. And infant ponderal index is used in pediatrics to assess whether a newborn baby is malnourished healthy or overweight as well as in conditions such as intrauterine growth restrictions. Okay. So this is an index which is used to assess a newborn is newborn's nutrition status whether it is malnourished, healthily healthy or overweight as well as in conditions such as intrauterine growth restrictions. Okay. And there is a formula for the uh, pondry index that is weight divided by height cube. Weight divided by height cube is the uh, value uh, is the formula for the ponderal index. Okay. I think so that is an informative question for you. So moving on to the uh, next uh, fifth question in our series and the fifth question is from the central nervous system and the question is which among the following is associated with absence of sulci and gyri okay absence of sulci and gyri so the options for you are first option is foreign cephaly option number b listen cephaly option number c pachygyria option number d macrocephaly so what is the answer for this question condition characterized by absence of sulci and gyri so what is the answer? So the answer for this question is option number B that is a listen cephaly. So we will see what all these cephalis. Okay. So the first one is the listen cephaly. 
it is a rare gene linked brain malformation which is characterized by the absence of convolutions in the cerebral cortex and an extremely small head. So there will be absence of sulci and gyri in the brain and there will be microcephaly. And the word lysencephaly literally means smooth brain because there is no convulsions, there is convolutions, there is no upfolds, nothing. That is that gyre and sulci is absent. Because of that, of that, the brain will appear very smooth. So that is otherwise known as the smooth brain or a lysencephaly. Okay, understood? Then next option was porencephaly. So what is a porencephaly? It is an extremely rare disorder of the central nervous system that causes a cyst or cavity which is filled with cerebrospinal fluid to develop within the brain okay so here there is a development of a cyst or a cavity and that will be filled with cerebrospinal fluid that condition is called as the porencephaly which is a very extremely rare disorder of the central nervous system okay so first is the lysencephaly next one is the porencephaly then we will see about the pachygyria so what is a pachygyria it is a developmental condition due to the abnormal migration of neurons in the developing brain and nervous system. So, with pachygyria, there are few gyri and they are usually broad and flat. So, in pachygyria, gyris will be there, but the number of gyri will be very less. Very few gyras will be there and will be usually broad and flat. So, don't be confused with the lysencephaly. Lysencephaly is the complete absence of sulci and gyri. But in pachygyria, there will be few gyri and that gyris will be broad and flat. So, that is pachygyria. This is because of the abnormal migration of neurons. And the final option was regarding the macrocephaly. So, what is a macrocephaly? As the name indicates, it is a condition in which the head circumference of an infant is above two standard deviation, which is above the 97th percentile. Okay. So, in this, you have to find out what is the normal head circumference of a newborn. And uh, then that will be two standard deviations above the uh, 97th percentile. Okay, so that, that is a, another clue or a hint point for you to refer further. That is a normal head circumference. Already the midarm circumference we have explained in this session. Okay, so that you can refer. So, with this question you are getting information regarding some cephalics. Okay, now we will move on to the sixth question in our series and the question is how do you define a patient who is drowsy needs gentle verbal simulation to initiate a response? Okay, so this is question is regarding the level of consciousness and the options for you are option number A, obtended, option number B, lethargic, option number C, confused and option number D, stupors. So, how do you define a patient who is drowsy but needs very gentle verbal stimulation to initiate a response? So, what is the answer? And the answer code for this question is option number B, that is lethargic. So, this is actually what is lethargic. So, we will have a small explanation regarding these terms. So, the first is a confused. So, what is a confused state means disoriented to the surroundings and may have impaired judgment and may need cues to respond to the commands. Okay, so the patient is awake here but disoriented to the surroundings and have impaired judgment but need some cues to respond to the commands. Then second is the lethargic. Lethargic means here the patient is drowsy and needs gentle verbal or touch stimulation to initiate a response. So that was the question we have asked. Then third is the obtended. So what is an obtended means? So here responds slowly to external stimulation and needs a repeated stimulation to maintain attention and response. Okay. So here we need to give continuous repeated stimulation to maintain the attention and response. That is known as the obtended. Okay. And then what is a stuporous? Stuporous means response only minimally with vigorous stimulation may only mourn as a verbal response. Okay. So in stuporous means very minimal response with the vigorous stimulation and sometimes they may only mourn. Okay. And the final state is the comatose means there is no observable response to any external stimuli. So, these are the steps of the level of consciousness and you have to keep in mind these steps. That means confused, lethargic, obtended, stuporous, comatose. Okay. So, I think that is very, very, very informative question for you. Now, uh, we will move on to the seventh question in our series and from the cardiology. So, which murmur changes with position? So, which valve murmur 
changes with position okay so simple but very important and confused so the options are first one is aortic option number b pulmonic option number c tricuspid option number d mitral so among this which murmurs changes which valve murmurs changes with position so the answer for this question is option number b that is pulmonic okay pulmonic so Mm, pulmonary flow murmurs so we will have a small explanation so these are these pulmonary flow murmurs are high pitched harsher murmurs heard at the upper left sternal border okay so you are getting another point that pulmonary flow murmurs the best position to auscultate is the upper left sternal borders because they are high pitched they are heard best with the diaphragm of the stethoscope and they are flow dependent so this is very important these murmurs are flow dependent and also will change with position alteration and decrease or disappear with valsalva maneuver so we are getting bunch of information from this heading that means these murmurs are flow dependent it will change with position and it will decrease or disappear with valsalva maneuver these are pulmonary flow murmurs and best heard over the upper left sternal border okay so you are getting many information from this uh, question so i think that was very 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 informative and important for you now we will move on to the eighth question in our series so the question is what is the second line treatment for status epilepticus status epilepticus so what is the second line treatment for status epilepticus okay question be careful so the options are option number a lorazepam option number b diazepam option number c levetiracetam option number d midazolam it's a very very simple question just carefully you should read the question that's all okay so what is the answer very simple question answer is option number c that is levetiracetam so you know that the first line management and the second line management so for the first line treatment of early status epilepticus mainly comprises the administration of benzodiazepines and the most frequently used of which include diazepam lorazepam and midazolam okay so these are the first line treatment options for the status epilepticus then the second line options is to control the further development of the seizures and for that anti epileptics like levetiracetam valproate and phenytoin these are the most commonly used second line medications for status epilepticus okay so i think that is clear okay now uh, we will move on to the ninth question in our series and the question is which among the following is associated with hypersomnia hyperphagia and hypersexuality okay so three key terms in the questions are hypersomnia hyperphagia hypersexuality so we will have the options which are very confusing so the first option is charles bonnet syndrome option number b frigoli syndrome option number c alice in wonderland syndrome and option number d clean levin syndrome so which is associated with hypersomnia hyperphagia hypersexuality so after finishing this question you will be getting information regarding four very very important syndromes okay so the answer for this question is option number d that is a clean levin syndrome so first of all we will see what is clean levin syndrome it is a rare disease which is characterized by recurrent episodes of hypersomnia and to various degrees behavior or cognitive disturbances compulsive eating behavior that is hyperphagia and hypersexuality okay so what is this clean levin syndrome and what all are this uh, just i have mentioned about the characteristics so other things you can refer and see these are the clue points or the hint points what i am giving you for to refer further okay so the other syndromes like charles bonnet syndrome or the cbs it is a common condition among people with serious vision loss which is characterized by temporary visual hallucination okay so charles bonnet syndrome is associated with the temporary visual hallucination among patients with serious vision loss problems okay vision problems so another syndrome was the frigoli syndrome or frigoli delusions why this is the delusional belief that a familiar person is following the patient and repeatedly change their appearance and appear in the person's life okay and this person is of a persecuted type of person like a delusion is there and 
this type of delusion is known as the Frigoli syndrome. Okay. It is a familiar person. It is not an unknown person. It is a familiar persecutory person. Uh, person that is persecutory. That means that patient is repeatedly changing their appearance and appear in the person's life. So that is a Frigoli syndrome. And another interesting syndrome was the Alice in Wonderland syndrome, otherwise known as the Toad syndrome. So what is a Toad syndrome? It describes a set of symptoms with alteration of body image. An alteration of visual perception is found in that way that the sizes of the body parts or sizes of the external objects are perceived incorrectly and the most common perceptions are at night okay so that's why it is known as the alice in wonderland syndrome okay so the size of the organ the size of our body parts or size of sizes of the external objects are perceived incorrectly so that is known as the alice in wonderland syndrome or the toad syndrome okay so i am i think i am you are getting some information regarding some syndromes okay further you can uh, refer more about this syndromes for your better performance okay now uh, we will move on to uh, the 10th the 10th question in our series so the question is very simple which chemical is used to test albumin in urine so this is regarding the urine test and which chemical is used for testing albumin so the options are option number a benedict's reagent option number b sulfosalicylic acid then option number c ferric chloride and option number d sodium nitroprusside so, which chemical is used in the urine to test for the albumin levels? So, the answer for this question is option number B that is sulfosalicylic acid. Okay. So, you know that if you are adding a few drops of sulfosalicylic acid and if you heat it gently, a whitish or cloudy turbid solution or precipitate can be seen in the solution and that is indicative of albumin in the urine sample. So, urine albumin testing is using uh, testing is using the sulfur salicylic acid as the reagent. Okay. So, the appearance will be whitish or cloudy turbid solution or a precipitate can be seen. Then what about the other chemicals? We know that that Benedict solution so we will explain regarding the brandy solution later that you know Follings test with the ferric chloride so one of the option was the ferric chloride and the test is known as the Follings test so what it test so reaction with ferric chloride is a classical test for the screening and detection of new bones with phenyl ketonuria okay so phenyl ketonuria can be identified with the help of Follings test and the chemical used is ferric chloride okay ferric chloride Follings test Okay, then next is the sodium nitroprusate. So, reaction of sodium nitroprusate with the sulfide, sulfhydryl com compounds yields rose or purple red complex products to rule out cystinuria. Okay, so to rule out cystinuria, we are using sodium nitroprusate in the urine to find out some rose or purple red complex products okay so that is suggestive of cysteine urea so these are some key takeaway messages or the takeaway points that you in, that will help you for the upcoming exams okay so already i have explained about the uh, benedict's reagent that is for testing the urine sugar levels okay that we were doing during our first year uh, course okay so now uh, we will move on to the next question in our series that is the 11th question it is a picture based question and you have to identify the image here i have given an image so you should identify what it is so what is the answer so the options are option a malicot catheter option number b pigtail catheter option number c bougie and option number d infant feeding tube so what is the answer for this question so what is this image so the answer is option number B, pigtail catheter. So you can see a pigtail in this instrument. So we will have a detailed explanation about this uh, image. So thoracostomy tubes are indicated for management of air or fluid in the pleural cavity. Okay. So in that the pigtail catheters have emerged as an effective and less morbid alternative to traditional large bore chest tubes or evacuation of pleural air or fluid okay so this pigtail tube it is a thoracostomy tube which are used for the management of air or fluid in the pleural cavity okay so the, that you can see in the question that it, the shape resembles that of a pigtail so that's why it is known as a pigtail 
catheter okay so now other tubes we can see that what is a malicode catheter malicode catheter so you can see the picture of a malicode catheter here so initially it was used for the bladder drainage in females but however now it is used only as an intercostal drainage catheter in case of empyma that is a pus then it is also used as a perinephric drain perinephric drain in post nephrectomy patients and also as a condom catheter in male patients okay so these many uses are there for the malicode catheter so this is a malicode catheter then another was the bugi so this is very familiar to you all that this is a tracheal tube introducer known as the buji is typically used to aid in the tracheal intubation in poor laryngoscopic views or after intubation attempts fail so these are the different types of bujis what i have shown in the picture okay so these are familiar to you and uh, uh, we will move on to the 12th question in our series and the question is which class of drugs are prescribed for patients with arterial occlusive disorder so what is the answer for this question so the uh, options for this uh, 12th question is uh, first one is the anticoagulant option number b anti platelet option number c muscle relaxant and option number d anti hypertensives so just think about what is the peripheral arterial occlusive disorder or the peripheral artery diseases and the what could be the answer so the answer for this question is option number b anti platelet okay so we know that occlusive peripheral arterial disease as the name indicates it is the blockage or narrowing of an artery in the legs or sometimes rarely in the arms usually due to atherosclerosis and resulting in decreased blood flow okay so the pathophysiology and the related complications that you know so this is a occlusive peripheral arterial disease so in this what is the medication that we have to give is according to guidelines taking aspirin or clopidogrel is recommended to reduce the occurrence of acute myocardial infarction stroke and other causes of vascular death in people with symptomatic peripheral artery diseases okay so here comes the importance of administering antiplatelets like aspirin clopidogrel etc etc to prevent the complications that is can, that can arise out of this peripheral artery diseases okay so the uh, platelets antiplatelet is the answer for this question okay so that's all regarding that question now we will move on to the 13th question in our series so the question is which among the following is associated with head injury and increased icp so some conditions i will be giving in the options in that you have to choose which one is associated with head injury and increased intracranial pressure so the options for you are option number a diabetes insipidus option number b exophthalmos option number c pheochromocytoma and final option number d cardiac arrhythmias so which is associated with the head injury and increased icp and what is the reason so that will be discussing in this question and the answer for this question is option number a that is diabetes insipidus okay so how diabetes insipidus is associated with head injury and increased icp so you know that the acute head trauma can lead to dysfunction of the hypothalamic neurons that secretes anti diuretic hormone okay so there will be in case of head injuries there will be whether that is a directly or indirectly it can affect the hypothalamic neurons to secrete the anti diuretic hormones and because of that that will cause what di diuresis will happen and can result in the uh, post traumatic diabetes insipidus okay so this is of the posterior pituitary gland and causing post traumatic di or ptdi so di the di diabetes insipidus is associated with the uh, uh, like a uh, uh, head injury and uh, and related increased icp changes okay so that's all regarding that question now we will move on to the second last question in our series and the question is which gas is used for inflating abdomen during laparoscopic surgeries so question is very simple so the options for you are option number a oxygen option number b carbon dioxide option number c nitrogen and option number d helium so which gas is used for inflating the abdomen for laparoscopic surgeries and what is the purpose 
so the answer for this question is option number b that is carbon dioxide okay carbon dioxide so you know that typically during the laparoscopic surgeries the abdomen abdomino pelvic cavity is first inflated with a gas to produce the space for viewing the surgical site and manipulating the instruments okay so carbon dioxide is the gas of choice which is used almost universally as the insufflation agent to create this space and it is called as the laparoscopic pneumoperitoneum so this is another question what is laparoscopic pneumoperitoneum means that is artificially we are inflating a gas to for the better visualization and for in manipulating the instruments during the laparoscopic surgery so carbon dioxide is the answer for this question okay so that's all regarding that question now uh, we will see the final the last question in this series and the question is heating the substance to boiling point and holding it there for 15 minutes three days in succession is called as dash so the question is heating the substance to a boiling point and sometimes near to the boiling point and holding it there for 15 minutes and this will be done every three days this is known as dash so the options are first one is a pasteurization Option number B, dry heat sterilization. Option number C, tindalization. And option number D, autoclaving. So, what is the answer for this question? Slightly confusing but uh, very important. So, the answer for this question is option number C, that is tindalization. So, what is tindalization? What we have already explained, it can be used to destroy the pores. Okay, And tindalization essentially consists of heating the substance to boiling point or just a little below the boiling point and holding it there for 15 minutes three days in succession okay so this is the tindalization process and the sterilization of the broth media is an example by tindalization okay the broth media sterilization is the example for the tindalization so what is broth media what is agar media those things you can refer later these are the another points that you have to refer later okay broth media it is a liquid media and uh, there are some peculiarities because uh, uh, for the growth of the organisms there are some peculiarities that you can refer later okay so that broth media sterilization can be done by tindalization and this is the procedure so you will see the other options also like what is a pasteurization so pasteurization is almost same but there are some differences like pasteurization is the process of heating and then a rapidly cooling liquids or food in order to kill the microbes that may expedite their spoilage or cause diseases okay so this is a pasteurization that means heating to the uh, maximum point and then a rapidly cooling down of the liquids or the food okay so that is known as a pasteurization then another option was the dry heat sterilization so what is a dry heat sterilization so the temperature is usually higher than 356 degree farad or uh, 180 degree celsius and the dry heat helps kill the organisms using the destructive oxidation method so this is the method of killing the organism in dry heat sterilization so this helps destroy large contaminating biomolecules such as proteins so the essential cell constituents are destroyed and the organism dies so that is a principle of dry heat sterilization so you are getting some uh, information uh, and some points for your exam like the temperature using the dry heat sterilization is 356 degree Fahrenheit or 180 degree Celsius and the method is that um, destructive oxidation method is the principle and the thing is the protein like essential cell constituents are getting destroyed and particularly the and uh, Consequently, the organism dies. So that is a principle. Okay. So that is a dry heat sterilization. And the final option was the autoclaving. So what is autoclaving? So the basic principle of steam sterilization, as accomplished in an autoclave, is to expose each item to direct steam contact at the required temperature and pressure for a specific period of time. Okay. So this is a principle the basic principle of autoclaving or the steam sterilization in autoclaving is to expose each and every item to direct steam so that other organisms will get uh, died so thus there are four parameters of steam sterilization which include steam as the name indicates the first one is the steam 
the second one is the pressure the third one is the temperature and the final one is the time okay steam pressure temperature and time these are some additional points that you can, uh, that will help you for preparing better so the two common steam stabilizing temperatures are 121 degrees celsius and 132 degrees celsius okay so the reason why this temperature and all you can refer later okay this is uh, just i am giving you some points okay so the temperature is 121 degrees celsius and 132 degrees celsius these are the two common steam stabilization temperatures okay so with that we are coming to the end of the another the second series second uh, series of an offset so um, i hope you enjoyed this video you have liked this video and uh, you got some or other information from this video so thank you for watching the video till the end and i request everyone who are watching this video to wait for the next video to come and kindly share about this platform to your friends and make use of it okay so once again thank you for watching the video see you soon in the next video till that time bye